Good afternoon, everyone. I see that you guys are, are, are rolling on in. Uh, welcome uh, to our information session uh, for this afternoon. We are uh, excited to be here with the Virginia Holocaust Museum. Uh, my name is Carl Hamuel, and I am the Associate State Director uh, in the Central Region of Virginia uh, here with AARP Virginia. Uh, we're so excited about this program um, and, and having uh, the Virginia Holocaust Museum with us today. And I'm going to turn things over at this time to one of our lovely volunteers, Ms. Renee Kirkland, who is going to do our introduction for today. We hope you have a, a wonderful time this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Renee Kirkland, and I serve as a community ambassador for AARP Virginia. Thank you for joining our program this afternoon. Part of healthy aging is making sure that we continue to engage our minds as we age. ARP Virginia, we promote and organize several programs that enrich the minds of the aging population and, off and offer workshops such as our Six Pillars of Brain Health workshop that makes us aware of how important it is to keep our minds sharp. Today, we have collaborated with the Virginia Holocaust Museum located in Richmond, Virginia, to teach us something new about the Holocaust as we give us, as well as give us a virtual peek into the Virginia Holocaust Museum. We are excited to learn and grow today and we hope all of you are too. Thank you again for joining us. And without further ado, I will turn things over things over to our instructor for the afternoon. We hope you all enjoy this presentation. Please be aware that we are gonna be taking questions. So please pay attention. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Renee. My name is Megan Ferenzi and I'm the director, director of education here at the Virginia Holocaust Museum. Um, this is my 11th year here in that role. I have a background of a degree in history, um, some graduate work in museum studies, and also in education. Um, I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. So if anyone is from Buffalo that is watching, hello and go build. Um, and my husband and I moved to Richmond about 12 years ago. Um, I started teaching in school and I've always really been interested in the Holocaust and in history um, and had always wanted to work in a Holocaust museum. And I was lucky enough to be able um, to do that and get this job about 11 years ago. So people often ask like, why would you want to work in a Holocaust museum? And I always tell people I get to see the Yes, I get to see the worst of humanity, but I also get to see the very best of it as well. So those are like rescuers, liberators, um, meeting and, and working with Holocaust survivors, some of who you'll you'll hear from either through interviews and I'll show you some photos and share some background um, about them as well. So, um, you know, yes, it is a difficult place to work, but you know, it's those stories of survivors that inspire us and give us hope. Um, so it looks like, you know, there's people from, from all over the place, which is amazing, which is awesome. I see some people from California and Texas, and that's great because I know there are several Holocaust museums and organizations in those states as well. Um, and we are here in Richmond, Virginia. So people often ask, like, why is there a Holocaust museum in Richmond? And, you know, there are Holocaust museums and organizations, education organizations, um, are usually in cities where there has been a large Holocaust um, survivor population. So in Richmond, um, sadly, it's, it's not the same today. But in Richmond, um, I would say there are about 150 to 200 survivors at one point um, living, not just in Richmond, but in the state of Virginia. So I'm going to actually share, and I apologize, um, I'm going to toggle between my PowerPoint presentation, and then also we have a video tour, um, and we're not going to watch it in its entirety, you're welcome to do that on your own. And I can, you know, share the link with Carl and maybe he can send out an email to people. Um, but I'm gonna kind of toggle between that with showing some photos, but then also looking at some video, which I think is really interactive um, and important to take a look at. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. Let's see. 
and Megan, while you're doing that, I just wanted to, to remind folks that uh, if you have any questions throughout, uh, please type your question in the chat. We'll be, we'll be monitoring the chat uh, throughout and we will try to ask your question for you uh, at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions throughout, please put that question within the chat and we'll try to get it answered at the end. Thank you. All right, so um, on your screen, I'm I'm hoping that you're taking a look um, at the Virginia Holocaust Museum. Um, we are located in downtown Richmond. Um, we started in 1997. We we're actually founded by a Holocaust survivor um, and several volunteers. And the first um, Holocaust Museum, it was actually in a small classroom in a synagogue. Um, not far away from the current museum, the current building we're in, um, but they quickly outgrew that space. And in 2003, the state of Virginia actually gave this museum um, this building. This is a former tobacco warehouse. It's from 1899. Um, so a lot more space um, to fill. Um, we have um, we have a permanent exhibition, so that means that there um, are exhibits that tell the story um, of local survivors with historical context of the Holocaust. Um, we also have um, not only stories of Holocaust survivors, but Holocaust liberators, so um, men that liberated concentration camps that live locally in Virginia, as well as uh, stories of Holocaust rescuers that live locally here in Virginia. Um, we have, like pre-COVID, we had between like 42 and I want to say about 45,000 vis visitors annually. Um, luckily, um, since it's been four, four years now almost, um, we're starting to get back up to those numbers again. Um, we have about seven to 8,000 students visit us every year as well. Um, spring is usually our busiest time um, because it's Holocaust International Holocaust Remembrance Day this um, this weekend, as well as in April, we have our Yom HaShoah, which is um, the remembrance of the 6 million Jews that were murdered during the Holocaust. Um, and also in schools, that's usually when they talk about World War II. So we're we're very busy here, um, and it, but if you have the opportunity, um, I'm not sure if anyone here is local in Virginia or maybe North Carolina, one of our neighboring states, or if you're here visiting, um, we welcome you to come see us. So we are free. We're open every single day of the week. Um, and we also have parking, which is really important when you're downtown. So I'm going to stop my share of this screen and I'm going to go to the video. And we're going to look at um, the, we're going to hear from the museum's executive director, um, and then we're going to start to take a tour of the museum. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to um, then stop the video and give you a little bit of information about the local survivors that you're hearing from. And again, if you have any questions for me, um, remember to type those in the chat because at the end, um, we'll answer those. Okay, we went all the way to the end. We look to safeguard the stories. I apologize, everybody. All right, there we go. I think I've got it. Hello, my name is Sam Asher. I'm executive director of the Virginia Holocaust Museum. At the museum, we look to safeguard the stories of victims of genocide and educate our visitors about the dangers of hatred unchecked. The members of the board and staff do not take this responsibility lightly. And for myself, the history of the Holocaust is personal. My family came from Płonsk, Poland. I had a large extended family that lived in Płonsk for many generations. That all changed on September 1, 1939 when Germany invaded Poland. Because my family was Jewish, they were subjected to discrimination and violence. Many died in concentration camps. My father, Cantor Arthur Asher, an American Jew studying in Europe, met the family in 1937. He kept a journal with all of their names and relationships. And by the end of the Holocaust, 73 members of my family had been murdered by the Nazis. Those that did manage to escape rebuilt their lives in Australia and Israel. 
The main entrance of this museum has great significance to me. It is here that you will see an exhibit about Poland, the Warsaw Ghetto, and train tracks used for deportation to Treblinka, a Nazi killing center. It is on tracks like these that my family was sent to their deaths. Learning about the Holocaust is difficult. It is a dark history that spotlights the worst of humanity. Nonetheless, it is an important history and one that needs to be confronted. It is through an examination of the Holocaust and hearing the stories of survivors that we are able to see the slow and systematic way in which people were labeled other, dehumanized, and then marked for murder. The Holocaust would not have been possible with just Hitler and the Nazis. The success of the Final Solution required collaborators and bystanders, people who participated in Nazi atrocities and those who remained indifferent to the Nazi crimes. We often get asked, how does the Holocaust happen? Why didn't more people speak up? To help you answer those questions, I ask that while you're taking the tour of the museum, you not only listen to the history, but reflect. Reflect on the responsibility of those that were not in Nazi uniforms. Ordinary German citizens, like teachers, religious leaders, scientists, doctors, friends and neighbors, who over a period of 12 years were witnesses to Nazi atrocities and remained silent. Unfortunately, injustice, anti-Semitism and racism did not end in 1945 with the Holocaust. So I ask that you reflect during this tour and I also issue a challenge. Now that you know about the history, what are you going to do the next time you witness an injustice? I invite you to begin your tour of the Virginia Holocaust Museum. The museum's director of guest services, Matt Simpson, will be your guide. Hi, I'm Matt. Please join me as we begin our tour at the museum boxcar. Here is a German boxcar, which was obtained in 2003 from Halter and Amzay, Germany, through the efforts of Holocaust survivors Jay Ibsen and Alexander Lebenstein. It is the largest artifact in the museum's collection. This boxcar was built in 1928 and was used on the German railways during World War II. While there is no evidence that this train car carried human cargo, it is identical to one type of freight car the Nazis most frequently used to transport Jews across Europe to the killing centers. The SS crammed 80 to 100 people inside these boxcars. Men, women, and children suffered in horrible conditions. There was no food, water, or even a place to sit down. These train rides could last for days. What was the transport like going from the ghetto to the camp? It was a car. Red, not green, like the one outside. A railroad car? A railroad car. It was pretty frightening. We knew where we were going. We spent two nights and needed a day and a half. That summer was very, very hot. Some people were dead on arrival in Auschwitz. If there was a frightening moment in my life, that was probably it. But at the same time, there was a sense of resignation. If they kill me, they kill me. There's really nothing we can do about it. And what you, there, there was a train? Yeah, when we walked on the train, you know, it wasn't train like transport people. This train was like to transport packages or whatever you do, you know. Mm -hmm. There was no, freight. there was no seat on it, nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. Was nothing. a freight. A train, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they have those little windows, you know, and they was 
closed up with barbed wire, you know, this little windows, not like, and there was no seats in it. Mm -hmm. We have to stay, stand up all the time, you know, mm -hmm. no toilet. They have some dish there, you know, yeah, the German standing by. Because the German was on the train too. For, for eliminating something. So you have to go to the bathroom. People see you when you go to the mm -hmm. a dish, you know, something. And we couldn't sit down. It's so like a herring. We were packed like that, you know. They put in so many people, you know, to the train, you know. We were standing up, laying on each other. Were you with your family? Yeah. You were all together. Right. Right, right. I don't know how we survived in the trip, you know. And uh, that lasted, Ava said lasted about two or three days, I don't remember exactly. Seems to me lasted at least for a week, you know, because it was, uh, when you're standing up, you know, and you don't sleep nothing, you know, and practically you don't eat hardly anything, you know. So it seems longer. All right, I'm going to stop um, the video right there. Um, so you were just able um, to hear from two survivors that live locally, um, actually in the Richmond area. Um, and the first was Ted Lehman, and Ted was born on July 25th, 1927 in Poland. And when the Nazis um, invaded Poland in 1939, he and his family were forced into a ghetto. Um, Ted actually survived by working in forced labor um, detachments. And then in 1943 in August, and he talks about how hot it was that summer, um, he actually was deported to Auschwitz, um, where he received one of the tattoos on his arm, and he was number 13996. Um, he spent several months in Auschwitz um, and then was transferred to a slave labor camp. Um, and then also worked in a Krupp armament factory. Um, and he was moved like several times and was used as a laborer um, during, uh, during the war. And he would dig tunnels in a nearby mountain as a part of a project um, for to create an underground factory for BMW. Um, and he actually uh, was able to escape um, during an air raid in 1940, um, for 1945. Um, and he remained on the move um, until he um, came across a United States Army hospital that would help him. Um, Post-war period, he worked with the United States military as a translator, which um, a lot of, um, you know, either as uh, people that were able to immigrate to the United States, um, many of them wanted to join the U.S. military, um, and they were um, usually accepted as translators because they could speak several languages. I think Ted was able to, I want to say, speak like five or six different languages. Um, he moved to the United States in 1947 and worked at a factory in Wisconsin. Um, and later he enrolled at the University of Wisconsin where he was able to receive both his bachelor's and his master's degree. Um, and this was before um, joining the army. Um, and then he also ended up com uh, completing a PhD from Columbia University's Russian Institute. So um, Ted actually moved out west um, many, many years ago. Um, he was um, pretty active in speaking. Um, so one of the things that we do here at the museum, as you saw in those video clips, is we, we actually um, interview survivors. So beginning in the 1990s here in Richmond, um, we started to interview Holocaust survivors about their experience. Um, and we, you know, as we move further away from the event, there are less survivors, but we are, we are still, um, finding, uh, people that maybe have, um, haven't lived in, you know, Richmond their entire lives, but maybe have moved here because they have, uh, children or grandchildren to be close to, um, and we will still interview them. Um, and those interviews are digitized and saved in our archives here at the museum. Um, we do have a pretty extension, uh, extensive artifact collection as well um, that includes photographs, documents, um, actual like physical artifacts. Um, 
as well. So, um, so Ted, uh, sadly, he passed away, I believe, a year or two ago. Um, and the second survivor that you heard from was Clara Daniels. Um, Clara Daniels was born Clara Freed, and she was born on October 17, 1923, in Hungary. Um, she had two brothers, an older brother named Laszlo and a younger brother named Joseph. Um, they lived, her and her family lived on a large farm that was very important to their local community. And in 1944, the family was sent to live in a ghetto. A few months later, they were deported to Auschwitz by a rail car, which you heard Clara speak about. Um, you heard her speak about the conditions in the car. She said it wasn't like a train. Um, if you've seen some of the photographs of those rail cars that were used during the Holocaust, um, it wasn't like a, a regular passenger train you would go on today. Um, it was one that didn't have any seats. People would be packed in. Um, sometimes there would be like one bucket in the middle that would um, people would need to use to go to the bathroom. I know with a lot of survivors that I've spoken to and heard their testimonies, um, I mean, they were packed in there for days. Um, women would have babies in those cars. Um, people would actually die um, because the journey was so like sometimes so long, they would die and they wouldn't know that people were dead until they got out because they had died standing up. Um, so the conditions were really bad in those cars, um, as you heard from Clara. Um, and so her family was sent to the ghetto in 1944, um, and they had been then sent to Auschwitz. Um, upon arrival, Clara is separated from her parents and her two brothers. Um, she did manage to um, find her cousins. Um, their names were Susan, Eva, and Katie. Um, later, Clara was sent to Dachau concentration camp in 1944, um, and then she was sent to another camp after that where she was liberated. Um, Clara lived in a displaced persons camp, um, which was basically um, a lot of times they would take concentration camps, right, because they have after the war is over, they have all these people in these camps um, and, you know, they have maybe their not near where their, you know, their country of origin is, right? Maybe they don't speak the language, they don't have any resources, they don't have any money or food, um, and their health is very poor. So they're going to um, basically turn these concentration camps, once these camps are liberated, into what are known as displaced person camps. Um, she eventually is going to come to the United States in 1949. She's going to meet her husband in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and uh, he had also immigrated from Poland as well. He had been in Auschwitz as well as five other concentration camps. Um, and they had two sons before they eventually moved down to Richmond. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to know, meet and work with Clara. Um, very small, very, you know, sweet woman. Um, and sadly, she passed away um, about five years ago. All right, so I'm going to um, put the video back up again. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, everyone can hear everything okay. Okay. Yeah. Between the museum entrance and the front door are authentic cobblestones from the main streets in the Warsaw Ghetto. Stones like these are visible in the street scene photo on the right taken in the Warsaw Ghetto in the winter of 1940. Lining the cobblestones are rails from the tracks that led directly into the Treblinka Killing Center in Poland. Many of the 350,000 Jews deported from Warsaw were sent to Treblinka to be murdered. Like I said, we live very close to the Warsaw Ghetto, which is, if I looked out the window here, not even a whole block, like a half a block, less than that, was the Warsaw Ghetto. And I would walk every day and I would see the, the ghetto, which was a very big brick wall. They were all closed up and Germans were all around. And they would look, they would be on the second floor above the brick wall and they look at everybody, look at people walking, that we were so lucky we were free. One day I noticed that they made a hole in the brick wall 
and snuck the baby there. But every day I was walking, I saw the, the, the poor Jews dying there from hunger. I couldn't do anything. I keep on going. I'm going to pause it right there. Um, I'm going to stop my share with that screen. I'm going to share my other screen and I apologize for like toggling through. Um, but I want to try and show you some pictures. Um, there's Clara and her family, the survivor I just spoke about. Um, there she is with a friend as well. Um, but the survivor that you just heard from, her name is Helena Zim. Um, and she was speaking about her experience um, living across the street from the Warsaw Ghetto. So Helena is Jewish. Um, she grew up in Loch, Poland. Um, she says she was born, I believe she was born in 1927, but she tells me she was born in 1928. Um, so she just turned 95. She is still alive. Um, she lived with her two parents um, and she had two sisters. She was the youngest of three girls. Um, her older sister was Helen, who also lived in the Richmond area. Um, and her younger, her middle sister's name was Nana. Um, in Poland, their life was pretty good until the Nazis invaded in 1939. Um, with the invasion, it closed schools and Jews were forced to wear the yellow star of David. Recognizing the danger to his family, um, Helena's uh, father actually um, wanted to try and evacuate Loch, which was a larger city, um, and make their way to a smaller village called Zarnoff, where her grandparents lived. Um, while they were on their way to Zarnoff, this smaller town, um, they were actually stopped by Nazis um, who stole, they were in a wagon, and they stole everything from them, including a ring that her father was wearing. It was this gold ring that Helena often talks about. And um, her father couldn't get it off for some reason off his finger. And they said, you know, if you can't get it off, we're going to cut it off your finger. Um, he eventually got the ring off um, and they were able to move ahead and, and eventually made their way to Zarnoff, but they had no belongings um, with them. While they're in the smaller um, town, there are rumors circulating about the existence of concentration camps. Not many people believe those stories. Um, and Helena's father, he did. He did believe those stories. Um, he knew that they're, you know, they weren't safe there um, as well. So he ended up getting two um, false birth certificates. Um, they were forged birth certificates for Helena and her older sister, Helen. Um, so a, a woman that Helena's father knew um, actually went to her priest. She was um, Catholic. She went to her priest and got copies of her two daughters' birth certificates and gave those to um, Solomon Drexler, who is Helena's father. Um, Helena was no longer Helena Drexler. She was now Wanda Kazusik, um, and she had a new name. Um, and in November of 1940, Helena says goodbye to her parents, and she knew that she would never see them again. And even all this time later, almost 85 years later, you know, she still talks about this and gets emotional, um, you know, rightly so, um, you know, remembering the last time that she saw her parents as a little girl. Um, Two weeks later, after Helena left Zarnoff, um, the Nazis invaded um, and ended up deporting the rest of the Jews in that small area. So um, her father, you know, had this like foresight um, and knew that it wasn't good for them to stay. And he, um, you know, decided to get them papers and ultimately saved um, their lives. Helena was able to escape to Warsaw, where in a train station, she searched um, for someone to help her. Helena met a woman who took her in, um, but neighbors began asking questions, right? So there's this new young girl in this um, home with this older woman that had never been there before. Um, so Helena knew that she needed to leave, and she found employment as a housekeeper for a young couple who lived across the street from the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, there's Helena and her husband after the war. Um, 
So Helena, as a teenager, is going to work as a housekeeper for this couple. And I mean, right across the street, they can see the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, there were many terrifying mo moments while Helena was, you know, we call this, we've heard of Anne Frank, right? Where you're physically hiding, right? Anne Frank was hiding in the secret annex. But instead of like hiding in a physical space, Helena was what we call hiding out in the open. So she had false papers. She had false identity. She was able to still be out and about, um, but she was no longer Helena, Helena Drexler. She is now Wanda Kazusik. She's no longer Jewish. She's now Catholic. Um, while she's working for this couple, one of the more terrifying moments that she often talks about is she would go to the market every single day because they did not have, um, you know, refrigeration within this apartment. So she would go to the market every single day as their housekeeper to get food, to make them breakfast. Um, and she noticed a woman from Loach. So that was the city that she was born in, that she lived for. Um, she lived there for a while until the Nazis invaded. Um, and she saw the woman, they had, they didn't really know each other, but the woman knew, you know, that it was Helena and that she was Jewish. Um, and when Helena got home that day, a little bit later, um, there were two, um, there was a Nazi officer and there was a Polish policeman. Um, and they were in this apartment and they accused Helena of being a Jew, um, and while they're there, they actually ask Helena um, to, um, you know, say, say Catholic prayer, Christian prayers. And um, the one thing that, you know, messed her up when they were questioning her was they said, you know, when you go to communion, um, what do you do? You eat anything? Do you drink anything? And she didn't know that. Um, and when she wasn't able to answer, they said they had a gun stuck in her back and they said, get up, you're a Jew. Um, and you know what we do to Jews. And it was actually the woman that she was working for, um, ended up saving her and said, you know, this child is not Jewish. Her mother writes her letters. Um, and unbeknownst to this woman, the, the person, it wasn't her mother writing her letters. It was Helena's older sister, Helen, writing her letters pretending to be their mother so that um, she wouldn't, this woman wouldn't get suspicious um, of Helena. Um, and, you know, I often think about that too, is as a teenager, I mean, both of these girls were teenagers at the time, to have that, like, the, you know, the the um the smarts to like the street smarts to be able to like think of that to be able to do that um is really pretty amazing um you know i don't know if i when i was that young if i would even think to do something like that um helena eventually um you know she describes living across from the warsaw ghetto she saw the warsaw ghetto uprising eventually um she is liberated um, by the Russians um, and she's going to meet her future husband, Alan Zim, who you see in this photo um, in 1945. Um, Alan is also a Holocaust survivor um, and the, the Zims shortly came to the United States. I believe they came in 1949 um, and they came right to Richmond um, where they, where Helena lives to this day. She's still active and still speaks, still um, spunky and feisty as ever. Um, and her husband, Alan, sadly passed away at the very beginning of COVID in 2020 from COVID. Um, and he was about three weeks away um, from his 100th birthday. Um, I also have to mention as well that um, Helena um, married Alan Zim and her sister, Helen, uh, her older sister, Helen, actually ended up marrying Alan's brother. So sisters married two brothers. So um, they both, their last names both became Zim. Um, and they both lived in the Richmond area. And actually, Helen passed away in early 2020 as well. All right. So I'm going to stop this share right here for a moment. Um, and I'm going to go back to the video. I'm going to share my screen again, and I appreciate your patience with me um, while I toggle through this um, 
presentation. Inside the museum, right outside the entrance to the permanent exhibit, you will notice the names of Holocaust survivors that have passed away. These were men and women who came to Richmond after 1945 and helped to build our community as they rebuilt their lives. Their legacy lives on with their memories in this museum. Also outside of the core exhibit entrance is a bench with a sign reading for Juden verboten, German for forbidden for Jews. This sign is intended to remind visitors of the fundamental ways in which Jews were systematically and legally removed from society. This is how the Holocaust began. Jews were forbidden to walk on sidewalks, to practice white collar professions, to marry non-Jews, or even to sit on benches like this one. The sign similarly reminds the visitor that this sort of injustice is not unique to Germany of the 1930s and 40s. These benches come from the former Broad Street train station, now the Science Museum of Virginia, here in Richmond. Signs declaring whites only or no coloreds were posted on these benches. As one goes through the museum, it is vitally important to remember that the Holocaust, while unique in many ways, is at its core another example of the dangers of hate and intolerance. At the conclusion of World War I, Europe lay in total disorder. Its economies in shambles, its populations decimated, and its cities destroyed. In subsequent years, Germany fell into one of the worst depressions in modern history. The war guilt clause of the Treaty of Versailles named Germany as the sole guilty party for all losses caused by the war. In the post-war period, the Weimar Republic, Germany's first attempt at a democracy, was installed. Germans distrusted Weimar from the onset, and the failure of the Weimar Republic to pull Germany out of its depression provided an entrance for the Nazis into German politics. Adolf Hitler and the National Socialist German Workers' Party, otherwise known as Nazis, filled the political vacuum of late Weimar politics. Hitler appeared publicly as a passionate, charismatic speaker, promising to solve Germany's problems. Although Hitler's own anti-Semitic beliefs were well known and documented in his memoir, Mein Kampf, his party did not come to power on an anti-Jewish platform. What made the Nazis appealing to Germans was the change they offered. Hitler pledged to create jobs and a vibrant new economy that would make Germany the envy of Europe, and promised to return German territory that had been taken away after the First World War. The Nazi rise to power was rapid. In the 1932 elections, the Nazis won 37% of the seats in the Reichstag, or German parliament. And though Hitler was not an elected official, he was appointed chancellor. After the death of German President Paul von Hindenburg, Hitler took total control of the government, assuming the position of Führer, or absolute leader. Infused with racial principles, the Nazis viewed the German people as the only pure race, sometimes called Aryans, while other races were labeled undesirable. Although Judaism is a religion, under the Nazi racial ideology, it was categorized as a race. In an early step to consolidate power, Hitler created new facilities called concentration camps, where his political enemies were imprisoned and mistreated without legal recourse. The first of these permanent camps was Dachau. The Dachau concentration camp was first used following the mass arrests ordered by Hitler in early March of 1933. Nazi SS and police rounded up political opponents, communists, socialists, liberals, conservatives, and members of religious parties affiliated with the Catholic and Protestant churches. From 1934, this process expanded continuously to include Jews, Sinti and Roma, Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals, and Protestant and Catholic clergy who opposed the Nazis. In 1937, the Gestapo, Nazi police, created an all-purpose term, enemies, and began arresting and confining those considered asocial. This was anyone who was deemed a real or potential risk to the country or an enemy of the German people. Asocials included alcoholics, drug addicts, beggars, homeless, the unemployed, and repeat offenders with petty criminal records. People that were physically and mentally disabled were also considered burdensome liabilities upon the state and targeted for elimination. 
In the Dachau exhibit, you see a replica of a prisoner barracks. In the same room, the visitor finds part of a concentration camp prisoner uniform, believed to be from the Sachsenhausen camp. It is authentic and was worn by multiple Nazi victims. When inmates were killed by SS guards or died from disease, starvation, or exhaustion, prisoner uniforms were cleaned and reissued. Note the colored patches worn to identify the categories of inmates. These uniforms and ID badges are an example of the dehumanization of undesirables that characterize the Holocaust. In concentration camps, triangle patches on uniforms functioned as a classification system. Green inverted triangles represented criminals. Red represented political opponents. Black for those labeled asocials. Homosexual men were given pink triangles and Jehovah's Witnesses were identified with purple. On the wall, opposite the barracks, is a list of the meager rations fed to prisoners, much of which was barely edible. Prisoners were purposefully underfed so that those who were too weak to work would die quickly. Inmate life expectancy in the camps was short. The enlarged wall photo of SS clerks at typewriters was taken at Buchenwald in 1937 during the national asocial action undertaken by the Gestapo. The men standing and those sitting behind them on the ground had been arrested in a national roundup the night before and are being registered as new inmates. Note with the photo the SS typewriter on the desk. Machinery like this was essential for the Nazis in industrializing the efforts of targeted harassment and ultimately mass murder. Right. I'm going to stop it there and I'm actually going to move forward um, and share one last uh, survivor story with you. Um, and then I'm going to uh, take some time and be able to answer some questions that you may have for me. Um, so I'm going to put it forward a little bit um, and hopefully I get this right. I need 1843. All right, let's see. We'll start it right there. Um, you're going to be hearing from Holocaust survivor Alex Liebenstein. You saw him a little earlier in this video in a photo. He's actually the survivor that helped to get the um, the rail car here to the museum. That rail car is from um, where he's from in Germany. So you're going to hear from Alex um, about his experience during Kristallnacht um, in 1938, which is known as the Night of Broken Glass, um, when um, when Nazis, as well as locals, um, they uh, ransacked, destroyed Jewish homes, businesses, and places of worship. Um, and you're going to hear from Alex about what that was like to witness that as a young Jewish boy, um, what that did to his family. And then I'll give you uh, a little more information about Alex, and then I will take some questions from you all. So I'm going to try and get it to where we need it. All right. Time, fairly large operation already. Over a 36-hour period between November 9th and 10th, 1938, the Nazi party and its SA and SS units went on a rampage against German Jews, destroying Jewish homes, synagogues, and businesses throughout Germany. The pretext for these attacks was the November 7th assassination of a German diplomat in Paris by Herschel Greenspan, a Jewish teenager whose parents, along with thousands of other Polish-born Jews, had been expelled from Germany. Presented to the world by Nazi propaganda as a spontaneous explosion of German nationalism and outrage, this national pogrom consisted of calculated acts of violence. During this nationwide attack, called Kristallnacht, more than 10,000 Jewish homes and businesses were looted and destroyed. Approximately 30,000 German Jews were arrested and imprisoned, and an estimated 1,574 synagogues were destroyed. The SS reported that 96 Jews were murdered during the violence. In the aftermath, the Nazi government fined the German Jewish community 1 billion Reichsmark, roughly $450 million in 2021, to pay for repairs and cleanup in cities damaged by the attacks. Hitler also ordered the confiscation of all insurance payments to Jews, so the victims of the violence had to pay twice. Beginning in 1941, all German Jews over the age of six had to wear the yellow Star of David on the front and back of their clothing. Similar measures had been or would be introduced across almost all Nazi-occupied territory. Marking with the yellow star, coupled with the reliance on Nazi racial pseudoscience, was the final measure required to make possible identification, arrest, deportation, and extermination. Mm. 
then we were told that the synagogue was being broken up and damaged very, very severely. But again, my, my father's friends came and said, Nathan, don't worry, they're not going to come here. They're not, they know that you are a true German and you fought in the war, in the First World War, side by side with us. They're not going to touch you. They're not going to do anything to you. You've never done anything wrong. And um, they're just not going to bother you. My, my father, even at that particular time, still wanted to believe, but I saw him also getting very anxious. And uh, we, we heard that another Jewish home was being plundered, and it was suggested by my, uh, by my father's friends that he should go and put his medals on his chest that he earned during the First World War to show that he is a veteran and that he has a right like anybody else to live there, which he did. He put on his medals and with some friends stood in front of our home. I was standing right beside him. And here these hordes of people suddenly came around the corner screaming anti-Semitic slogans, some of them carrying an ax or sticks. And they did not even bother to wait to come close to the house and I heard the window shatter, my father screaming out to these guys, you cannot do this to me. How dare you? I'm German and all this. Did he know any of them? Were these people he knew? There were some, I knew a couple of the children that were dressed in Nazi uniforms that I, some a couple of years prior, went to school with. Mm -hmm. The parents already, you know, um, converted them to uh, the Hitler Jugend. I'm sure that my father also recognized some, but a lot of these uh, uh, SS uniform people came from out of town. The leading people, I believe, came from out of town. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I wouldn't be able to uh, verify if my father knew exactly who was who. Mm -hmm. And here they were breaking the windows, and before you know it, people started to run into the house and uh, some of them went upstairs, and before you knew it, our, my father's, my parents' bedroom furniture were flying through the window from upstairs into the street, and I heard my mother scream inside, let's get out of here, they are killing us, they're killing us. By the way, this is recorded in the archives in Halton, so uh, I just want to mention it so it could be verified that this these were my mother's words. They documented this themselves yes. in Halton. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I'm staying with my father at all simul simultaneously. This all happened quite fast. And here these, this big SS guy approaches him, comes straight to him, and, and my father holds out his arms to say, Stop, you cannot go into my house. How dare you get these guys out of here? And this S guy, S guy said, what do you have there? He says, I'm a, a German soldier. I'm a decorated soldier. I fought for this country, and I have a right to be here. This S guy looked at him, and he tore the medals off his chest, stamped down on these medals and broke them in the street, and then spat in his face, started to beat down on him, and here I'm holding on to my father. This is the first time that I saw my parents being beaten and chased. And it became obviously probably the most hurtful time in my life, more painful perhaps than the physical pain I l endured later on. Oops, I'm going to stop that there. Um, and just because of limited time, um, but I wanna give you a little more information about Alex and then I will take some questions from you all. Um, so Alex was born in 1927 in Haltern, Germany, which he um, spoke a little bit about the city that he's from. Um, and he had a pretty sheltered childhood until he was 11. Um, he lived with his mom and his dad. His dad owned a kosher and non-kosher butcher shop um, and they were also um, operated a cattle trade as well. Um, his father, as he said, served in World War I um, in the German army. 
Um, and he had three older sisters. Um, one of them died in 1932, and the other two immigrated to the United States in 1939. Um, you heard about um, Alex's experience during Kristallnacht and what that was like for him and how scared it, how scary and painful it was. Um, he actually, you know, throughout the war, um, his uh, sadly, his mother um, had actually been taken out to a forest. Um, she was sent um, to to Riga, um, where she was shot and then buried. Um, and Alex himself was actually in several um, labor camps where he was forced to do labor. Um, he was then brought to Stutthof um, concentration camp. Um, in 1945, he was liberated by the Russians, um, and he ended up actually um, like trying to flee um, to Frankfurt um, because he did not want to join the Red Army. Um, eventually, he did make his way. He wanted to immigrate to Israel, um, but he did make his way to the United States in 1947, um, specifically to Richmond, Virginia, um, because um uh, his sisters were already here. So um, just a little information about Alex. Um, sadly, he passed away in 2010. Um, you know, and um, out of all the survivors that you've heard from, um, just um, just Helena um, is alive today. Um, so at this point, um, I would love um, to take your questions that you may have for me. Um, you know, I, I appreciate you inviting me to share the museum. Um, the history of the Holocaust, and most importantly, the stories of, um, you know, Virginia survivors as well. So I'm happy to take questions now if we have any, Carl. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. For You're welcome. That, that, that great presentation. Um, so informative, uh, so needed, and, and we really appreciate you uh, taking your time. Um, and, and and time out of your day and your busy schedule to, to share with us. Course, yeah. um, I see some folks uh, with a hand raised. If you could, if you have a question, just please drop it in the chat. Uh, we'll do our best to, to try to answer uh, those questions. I'm gonna start with some of the ones that I saw. And typically, um, I mean, there were, there were plenty of like, comments throughout, um, just affirming some of the information or um, just sharing uh, their response to some of the information that was shared. Uh, but one of the questions that was in the chat, uh, Megan, is how old is the oldest Holocaust survivor? How old? So um, I believe, and I'm not sure if in the world today, um, they're probably over 100. Um, I think the last... Um, the last survey that I saw, I believe there are 249,000 Holocaust survivors worldwide. Um, here in Richmond, I say we have, a, or in Virginia, I say we have maybe about like five left. Um, and the oldest one that I know of living here in Richmond is Helena, and she is um, 95 years old. Um, so, um, so, but there could be more out there. Um, that we just, you know, they haven't either come to the museum, we just don't know about them. Some people just, you know, um, which I completely understand and respect, they they don't want to talk about what happened to them. Yep. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, another question, uh, during the presentation, you mentioned uh, the story about Clara. Uh, someone asked what happened to Clara's family? Um, so Clara's family, she was the only um, survivor of um, her family. So they were sent to Auschwitz and I believe um, her um, and her brothers, I believe her parents and her brother, I believe they were um, murdered in Auschwitz. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the next question that someone had is, are there any museums near Wilmington, North Carolina? And if so, could you share their link for their virtual sure. tour? Um, so unfortunately, I don't believe there are any Holocaust museums in um, North Carolina. I know there is a Holocaust Education Commission and they work on 
Um, they may have some like public programming, but really they work on education in schools. Um, the, the A great place to check out um, Holocaust museums and to see where they are, actually not just in the United States, but worldwide, um, is the Association of Holocaust Organizations. And I will grab that link and I can um, put that in the chat for y'all. And you can actually search by state and see what types of organizations um, are in your area. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, the next question that we have is uh, someone was was commenting as as you were presenting says, so if the people couldn't sit on the benches or walk on the sidewalks, did that mean that Nazis wanted people to stay at home so that they were contained and wouldn't know what's going on? Was that the reason behind that? Um, I mean, really, the reason behind that um, is it's control, but it's also dehumanization, right? So if other people, um, other human beings are allowed to use certain facilities, right? And we see this, we see this in uh, southern states, right? Um, Post-Civil War. Um, you know, it's really about dehumanization of people, right? Um, I mean, everyone should be able to sit on a bench or go to, um, you know, movie theaters or um, sports stadiums. You, everyone should be able to receive, you know, a, a proper education. Um, I mean, and really it's, a, it's about control and it's about dehumanizing people, um, you know, and kind of limiting their participation in things that can bring people joy, right? Or even like jobs, you get money from that, you're able to pay bills, you're able to buy food, you're able to live, um, you know, with school, with education, right? When you're, when you're educated, you're able to question things and to know what's going on. Um, and in limiting those types of things, it's, um, it's really about control and, and dehumanization. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, <clears throat> Were the Virginia Holocaust Museum education programs updated after the 2017 Charlottesville neo-Nazi marches? So um, after Charlottesville, which I think, um, you know, we hate just because, you know, a war ends or laws are created and legislation is passed, it doesn't change people's hearts and minds. And, you know, with the ending of World War II and the Holocaust, things like anti-Semitism, you know, that that doesn't end, that still happens. Um, and it's, so it's always there, but I think it was really shocking um, for the world to see um, people in khaki pants and polo shirts, um, you know, uh, protesting in front of a very well-known uh, university. Um, you know, we often have this um, idea of what we think hate looks right or how it manifests in a person. Um, and, you know, for people that you think of neo-Nazis, right, you think of people with shaved heads, with like, um, you know, camo, camo pants and boots and, um, you know, people that may be like, you know, trying to scare you. Um, and really what's happening is they're trying to become more mainstream. Um, and so I think after that happened, we really tried to, I mean, we've always um, not only educated about the history, but also um, about the Jewish um, religion, right? We've also educated about anti-Semitism, which is hatred and bias towards Jews. Like some of those stereotypes and tropes that, you know, are not invented by Hitler and the Nazis, but are used by them, um, you know, to play on people's fears. Um, and those are thousands of years old. So we really focused a lot of our programming on anti-Semitism. Um, we worked with the University of Virginia and had a film screening here, which talked about that day um, and had a panel discussion with some people um, and kind of talked about like where we go from there. So I think it's just really um, a focus on education, not only about the history of the Holocaust, but about anti-Semitism about bias um, and about uh, hatred and racism as well. Thank you for that. Um, someone asked, how do we find our ancestors from the Holocaust? So um, there's like many different um, ways that you can go about this. Um, you're welcome to send me an email um, and I'd be happy to give you like several different organizations that can help you. Um, if you, um, you're welcome to email me and I am I can do that, but there's, um, you know, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is a great place to start. 
Um, there's also archives within um, Germany, right, um, that are that actually have just become open, some of those records. Um, there's the International Tracing Service as well, the ITS. Um, and depending on like where your family or relatives are from, that may be a good place to start as well. So if they're from, um, you know, Poland or Lithuania, then you might want to check out some organizations there that would be able to help you. Um, you know, I know even for us, like sometimes like barriers can be like, you know, the hours are different to be able to get in contact. There's the language barrier and also like the way information is disseminated and presented may be different than it is here in the United States. But um, I think the best thing to do would be to maybe email me and then I can um, I can give you some information on, on you know, who to contact and, and what to do next. Thank you for that. And and I'm so sorry, we're gonna have time for one more question. Um, I know so many people um, may have additional questions. And, and Megan, are you gonna drop your email in the chat? Yeah, um, I can do that right now. Okay, um, the last question that we're gonna take, it says, does the museum concentrate on the Holocaust or does it cover other areas of genocide throughout the world? Yeah, so we, um, our exhibits, our primary exhibit is focused on the Holocaust. Um, but we also talk about other genocides as well. So um, in our collection, we actually have interviews. Um, they're not video, they're recordings of Armenian survivors of the Armenian genocide. Um, we also have um, video testimony of Cambodian survivors and Rwandan survivors that um, came to Virginia and live in the community. Um, we have a speakers bureau as well that includes Holocaust survivors as well as survivors of the Rwandan genocide um, and the Cambodian. And I think it's really interesting um, you know, when, because off, you know, when we talk about the Holocaust, it, for students today, it's so long ago, but when they hear from a survivor of the Cambodian and especially the Rwandan genocide, because that was 1994, um, they're young, right? Um, so I think, you know, um, it's, it's really uh, like powerful and important for students to realize that, you know, uh, something like the Holocaust, which is genocide, right? It didn't end with the Holocaust. It continues to happen um, in this world and to be, you know, thinking and reflecting on like ways, like how do we stop this from happening again? Thank you so much, Megan. I, yeah, I, I appreciate you so much. Are there any final thoughts? Uh, I want to apologize to anybody if we weren't able to get to your questions uh, in the interest of time, but we did, we did drop um, Megan's email into the chat. Uh, but Megan, do you have any final thoughts or anything that you wanted to share with us? Yeah, I just wanted to say again, thank you so much um, for coming today and for hearing the stories of, uh, you know, survivors and their families. Um, it's it's so important um, that we, you know, learn, uh, learn about them and just really think and reflect on those lessons of the Holocaust because they're more important today than ever. So thank you very much. Thank you, Megan, for, for taking time to educate us on such an important topic. And, and thank you to all of you all uh, who, who joined us today. Thank you to Renee, our lovely volunteer, who gave our intro today. Uh, we hope that all of you all enjoyed uh, your time with us this afternoon. We hope that you learned something. Uh, and we hope that you will uh, join us next time as we continue to do more events like this. Uh, continue to monitor our page, our, 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 our social media and our pages um, as we continue to bring more events like this. But thank you, thank you, Megan, for sharing today. Uh, we really appreciate you and we hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, everybody. Thank you.